Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts for this episode, Jamie, joined by Devin Eckberg, and we're continuing our retirement income series with uh, somebody, if you pay attention to the retirement income space, you have probably heard of before, right? Jeff, excited to have you on here and uh, talking about your, your least favorite topic, you know, <laughs> retirement income and taxes. <laughs> oh man, if I just, I just, I really can't stand this topic. No, of course, this is, this is, this is it. This is what, uh, what gets me up every morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're in, uh, if, if people are listening to it, you are in true form here, right? You've got your vest on and everything. So we're, we are ready to go. That's my cheesy, you know, I'm a retirement guy. I've got to be fully vested. Started very, very young and <laughs> I have continued it to it to, to this day. And then it got stolen by those, uh, you know, fully vested, invested, invested uh, commercials. <laughs> uh, and then recently, more recently, another financial firm I saw pulled a fully vested uh, advertising campaign. So, but mm. I, I was first. I was mm. first to the game. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, last time we did one, I'm not changing this time, but we were doing a webinar and you were like, Jamie, you're too dressed up. I like, I like relax Jamie now. Mm -hmm. So I, I changed, right? And came back with my, my Henley t shirt. I thought whatever. that was great. Yeah. I was, I was so happy to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they were asking me for dinner tonight um, if I'm going to change. I, I'm going to get my Jamie Hopkins Henley shirts on. I have like 20 of them now and people keep it. It's like the only shirt that I really I like wearing but talk about dinner and food we'll lead into that um what's your favorite food dish or what's speaking to you lately about food you know i, I like all unfortunately i mean you could probably tell i don't really dislike much um big fan of sushi probably if i had to you know go one way sushi would be up there really like uh, greek or mediterranean food but um yeah i think uh, and then of course you know there's always just just like a good bagel and lox mm. You know, that is, uh, a lot of people may know that I moved from New York to St. Louis recently. And people are like, how do you like St. Louis? Is it, is it, you know, do you, do you miss New York? I don't, honestly. Like, <laughs> I really love St. Louis and I really don't miss, I miss people, but I don't mm -hmm. miss New York. I miss a good bagel and lox. Yeah. It just, that's, that's tough to find. And you travel a ton. Is there any like city or place that you liked uh, that you get excited to for the food? Uh, New Orleans, actually. Yeah, New Orleans. Uh, sorry, Narlins. Uh, <laughs> uh, that would be probably my favorite. Just there's just seafood galore. And, and I just I mean, I love seafood. I could sit there and eat oysters forever. Uh, so that that's probably up there. I mean, New York has great food. Chicago has great food. Austin's a fun food city. But um, yeah, if I had to, you know, for a single meal, New Orleans is uh, is probably at the top of that list. I don't know. I could eat that every night, but uh, but boy, that that's good. Yeah. Are, are, are you a raw oyster guy or the grilled uh, butter oysters? I'll eat them, however, but uh, I, I like raw oysters. That's, yeah. yeah, just the the brininess of it is just yeah. It, um I really want to enter myself in one of those all-you-can-eat oyster eating mm -hmm. contests one day just so I can eat a whole bunch of oysters. <laughs> They're so expensive, right? Yeah. You go like, to a nice restaurant, it's like $4 for an oyster. I'm like, that's, a, that's pricey. That's a good one. <laughs> Yeah. Spoken like a true accountant. Like <laughs> yeah. How do I get the most free oysters? That's possible? pretty much it. <laughs> well, those, uh, those, the, see, I like that one because uh, Dr. Daniel Crosby posted on Twitter one time, right? Like, what item would you pick in a food eating competition if, like, your life depended on it? Mm -hmm. And, like, every person is like tacos. And I'm like, that is a terrible decision because oh, yeah. most people like tacos. I picked mayonnaise. I am totally fine wagering my life on a mayonnaise eating competition oh. if I have to decide on that, right? So like oysters is another good one because some people can't eat them, right? So it's a, it's a better strategy. Oh man, there. if I had a, mayonnaise would be a bad one for me. I, mayonnaise and ketchup, I can't do, mustard I could do, but generally like condiments, mm -hmm. I um, like ketchup is my fight. Like it is, <laughs> I, I cannot do that. In fact, uh, I think was it you who were yeah. starting that a few years uh -huh. ago with the uh, was it right weren't we uh, we did about yeah, two years ago no kid yeah. le uh, no kid hungry yeah, yeah I I squirted ketchup in my mouth directly for five hundred dollars and it was well worth it for a charity but man I. I, I yeah. barely held it together. It's yeah. amazing that I'm in Nashville. And I'm losing my appetite. <laughs> conversation alone. Um, so speaking of CPA, you, you started your career as a CPA or accountant, I believe. Uh, you, you somewhat, you know. yeah. So I, you know, I had a really weird journey um, to to the industry. Never thought that this would be even the industry I'm in. But um, but effectively, I had an opportunity to go work with Ed Slot and Company, and I'm chopping off like the 99% of this story, but effectively once I was there, Ed said, you know, if, 
if people are going to take you seriously in this area, you probably need to be a CPA. You need to go back and get your CPA. And I was really fortunate. He helped me to, um, you know, to get my master's and make sure that I had enough credits to sit down for the CPA exam because uh, years ago, you didn't need the same credits you do today, but you need X amount of, at least in, in New York and most states, you need X amount of, uh, you know, accounting credits. And I had none undergraduate. So I went on to get my master's in accountancy uh, and uh, then sat for the CPA exam. And uh, I think probably, uh, you know, probably 12 or 13 years now, something like that. Yeah. And it's not often that CPAs get into, you know, wealth management in general or, yeah. or retirement income in particular. So, so why? What, what, draw you, what draws you to that topic as an area of, of interest for you or passion? I think it's really just a matter of outlook on life. You know, to me, most CPAs, at least tax CPAs, right? Because, yeah, I guess you can even throw auditors in there too. But most CPAs are historians, right? They're great historians, but they're historians. They're looking back and saying what happened and trying to accurately record that as precise as possible just with numbers instead of words. And while there's value to that, I, I, you know, I think history is important, but I'm much more interested in changing the future than I am looking at what happened to the past. And, and certainly the past in, informs the future, but I always thought, well, I'm less interested in how much tax you have to pay or paid last year and much more interested in how I can make that number lower next year or the year after that or the year after that. So for me, it was just a matter of, you know, of mindset, always forward looking and, and, and not in the past. But, you know, again, I think there's importance in both areas. But for me, I'm just drawn more towards the future outlook. Well, there's two main topics I want to be able to cover here with you today. And, you know, the kind of the whole point of this is to help advisors better communicate with their clients. And I think the tax world can be a challenging communication world, right, where we get very yes. detailed. We've got detailed rules. And they don't always feel like they make sense. <laughs> that is literally why you, we have jobs, right? Mm -hmm. is, these rules make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's start with um, kind of the probably a, a, a kind of a little bit of an esoteric term to right? tax efficient retirement income planning, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but what I mean by that is, right, we're probably trying to just create a better outcome for clients, right? Sure. By looking forward. And um, so how do you approach that topic holistically today? How do you look at creating a more efficient retirement income plan? Well, I think for me, it starts with a recognition that taxes are a part of life, right? We're, we're going to have income tax. It's probably going to be here uh, for as long as I am. And that at least with respect to retirement accounts, right, you're going to pay the piper at some point. The really awesome thing is that you actually get the choice to determine in large part when you get to pay that bill, right? So, I mean, yes, we do get to required minimum distributions generally at 72. Um, you have to start taking money out. And of course, when somebody dies, there are different rules there. But uh, at a high level, you have a really good um, you have really good control over when you pay that tax bill, whether it's a Roth account to start or a traditional IRA, whether you start with a traditional, excuse me, a traditional account and then shift via a conversion into the Roth, um, whether you take distributions just to fund your lifestyle at 65 or you use your taxable account. I mean, there's just a lot of optionality that you, you kind of built into the system. And so for me, at, at the highest point, it's recognizing that when we're talking about good tax planning, um, I'm, I'm really harp on the idea that good tax planning is not the lowest tax bill in one year, right? It's the lowest lifetime tax bill. And for a lot of advisors and for a lot of, of the higher income, higher net worth individuals out there, they're fortunate enough that it's, it's not just the lifetime tax bill, but it's, it's, it could be generational tax bill, right? Not just for me, but for my children, for my grandchildren, et cetera. So if we want to zoom out even further, it's ultimately, how do I pay the lowest amount of tax on the wealth that I create during my lifetime? That again, may not be paid during my lifetime, but the wealth that's created during my lifetime, how do we minimize that tax bill over the course of, uh, of all future? It goes way beyond what maybe it used to be, where it's just defer, defer, defer at, mm -hmm. a, at all costs. You know, there's there's quite a bit more you know complex strategies to think of of bringing income forward or you know making other other choices. What what kind of trends are you seeing there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was that, and still to this day, if you ask CPAs about Roth conversions, they are are as a whole. Now we're getting better uh, as an industry, but many of my colleagues are like, why would you pay tax on something before you have to? Like, because I'd rather pay tax on a nickel today than a dime in the future. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So let's 
let's figure out again what creates that lowest lifetime tax bill. As far as trends, I think we are seeing a, a pickup in Roth accounts. Um, that's mm-hmm. certainly the case. And um, sometimes I hear from folks like, "Well, what if they get rid of the Roth?" That's my my concern. Like, what if they change the rules? And I'm kind of of the opinion like. No, that's not going to happen. In fact, um, everything that we've seen recently would give us more, um, you know, more thought that these are not going away. In fact, they're going to go more towards that than away from that. Uh, Leading up to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, we had potential, quote unquote, Rothification of all retirement accounts up until about a month or so before the bill was passed. Uh, Secure Act 2.0, that's making its way through Congress right now. There's proposed Rothification, meaning only Roth accounts uh, for catch-up contributions to retirement plans. So we've got all these things that are leading us more towards Roths and also just the fact that we've only had the Roth IRA for a couple of decades or so, whereas, you know, traditional accounts have existed longer than that. Uh, beyond that, it's uh, how do I use my IRA to, uh, to take care of myself f- from a charitable perspective? You know, that, those are some of the things, you know, whether it's qualified charitable distributions or whether it's, um, you know, looking at how do I leverage my IRA again for the next generation? Those are things that are, are more common today than I think we've, we've seen in the past. I'd actually like to just get a a little bit of your opinion on this one, which is, you know, when we talk about Roths um, and this kind of, you know, hopefully tax free bucket, right? Mm -hmm. As long as we follow the rules and hold it for long enough. uh, When you look at those, I mean, uh, today, do you lean more generally towards a Roth or more towards a traditional? And I know it's not a, you know, easy, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously it always depends, but um, I've just kind of. I'd say, you know, my own personal is if all things being equal, I would I would lean towards Roth today. Um, but and if you know, I guess, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I agree. So if, if all things being equal, I lean towards Roth. In fact, um, even if it's perhaps slightly negative, um, I might even lean towards Roth. The, the way I the way I, I like to think about this at a conceptual level with um, both advisors and, and more uh, directly with end clients themselves is think of the Roth IRA, or at least I do, as tax insurance. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it, it, we're paying something today to insure something in the future, right? I want to pay a zero tax in the future. I don't know what future tax rates will be. And so just like any type of insurance, you've got to weigh the, the costs and the benefit of that insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, A lot of people today would benefit from long-term care insurance, but they've made the decision, whether right or wrong, right, that it's too expensive for them. I think probably more people should have it, but that's a whole separate issue, right? But they've made the decision that based on that cost, it's it's not, um, you know, it's not for me. But if you talk to young people, almost everyone has, um, or at least a lot of people have term insurance, right? Especially young executives, they recognize that that is, uh, you know, as something that is important for them. They look at the cost and they say, yeah, it's, you know, pennies on the dollar. I'll, 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 sp- I'll splurge for that. And so for me, um, you know, there's, I think when we talk about Roth IRAs, I think that tax diversification is an oversold thing. The tax diversification is what we end up with um, if we happen to have a reason to go with a Roth and a traditional and a taxable account for a little bit. But it's not the end goal, right? Diversification of investments is the common refrain I hear like, well, you're you're comfortable speaking as the advisor. Well, you you know about the benefits of diversification from an investment perspective. We want that same benefit in in retirement. And it's not the same because diversification of investments inherently provides a benefit by itself, right? Like have diversified investments, benefit of lower correlated portfolio, higher risk adjusted return, all the things that we know. Have uh, someone who is a in the 37% bracket today while they're working, and we expect when they retire, uh, they're going to have like $200,000 of income. So like, a lot of retirement income. Almost everyone in the country would, you know, would love to trade places with them. But at $200,000 of income, we're nowhere near the 37% bracket. And you have to believe that future tax rates will go up by 50% from where they are today in order to see a, you know, a, a higher tax rate. So for me, that would be someone who'd use the, the pre-tax account. The insurance cost would not be worth it. But if I had a client today in the 24% bracket, and I thought they might be in the 22% bracket in the future, there's one where I might say, you know, I actually think you might overpay your taxes by 2%. But the, the premium here, right, mm-hmm. is uh, the cost of that quote-unquote tax insurance might be worth it because 
What if they do raise rates mm-hmm. in the future? What if, um, you, if you're married? What if one of you happens to pass away unexpected early and you go from joint brackets to single brackets? What if you decide, you know, your kids move to uh, California and you're in Texas and all of a sudden you find yourself subject to California income tax? You never thought you'd be there. You know, there is that I don't know what the future holds element. And so paying that insurance premium up front of the tax liability is is the way I kind of frame it. Do you feel like a lot of the anxieties you hear from people about like the future of taxation kind of comes from uh, like something that's very unrealistic? Like you mentioned, like, uh, you know, the tax rates have to go up by like 50 percent or more for that to, you know, to be a, a thing. Or uh, you always hear, you know, they might means test me as that, you know, as I'm drawing it out and yeah. all these sorts of things that they're conjuring in their mind. But, you know, how predictable is that, number one? And really, how realistic is that, number two? So I actually don't think we're going to see income taxation on Roths anytime soon. Um, I I think the much more likely outcome here is if they're going to change something and monkey with something, we end up with like required minimum distributions on Roths at some point, you know, it aligns it. They'll, they'll put some really nice, you know, uh, window dressing on it. Like we're harmonizing the rules for retirement accounts. Secure (laughs) Secure Act 3.0. That's right. (laughs) Forced distributions. If it gets over a, you know, a certain amount, I think is something that I've, I've heard. Yeah. That's been proposed and built back better right? yep yeah. yep i mean that would be a you know well at least what was initially proposed like 10 million plus and, and look uh, if uh, there are uh, there's a little bit of a different calculus if your retirement accounts are in that stratosphere you know you might think slightly right. differently about this but and of course the common frame is well what if they do 10 million then they just change it to five then they change it there's there's uh, there's something to it right i mean I, i'm not going to deny that the government needs money. But we, uh, we stress about this so much right now yes. when the chances of that happening and, and, and whether it being in the form that we're even stressed about, they're usually pretty low. Uh, it, we're yes. overstressed. A hundred percent. If I were sitting, you know, at, across the table of all, of all the things that I might think of that I would worry about as a, you know, as a consumer, the idea that the Roth IRA would be taxable to me in the future is is super low on that list and, and even with that 10 million dollar limit that we're talking about it still wouldn't change the fact that most of it would be tax-free right it would just be you wouldn't be able to keep it in the roth i get definitely diminishes the benefit but yes to your point people spend way too much time i think the the again the two biggest things maybe would be one day roth convert um, rmds in the future i could see that although for today but it's not something that's being talked about at least right this moment um the other thing is uh, if one day we end up like a lot of other developed countries and we go to a, some sort of vat you know if i'm a, a roth ira owner i don't want to see a vat i want to see higher income tax you know raise the income tax rate if you need money don't don't create a vat right. um but again that is something that we are probably decades away from, if anything. Well, and that's what I liked about the strategies you were listing off earlier is because you can make actual good decisions with the data that we have now with under this current rule set. And, you know, we don't know what the future is going to look like, but you can actually make some pretty, you know, maximizing moves today based on what we know about today. Yeah, I mean, what's the worst that happens? So I, I, if I'm paying, ta- again, if I pay tax at a 24% rate and everything stays exactly the same, uh, so I, I, I overpaid a little bit, it, it, but I, I, I have a known outcome, right? It's, it's, there are so many risks in retirement, so many unknowns. What will interest rates be? What will inflation be? What will markets do? How long will I live? Well, you know, what will tax rates be? If I could, uh, if I could just change one of those, I mean, it's like why some people like annuities, right? Or, or some people like uh, tips, you know, or whatever. Like if I can take a portion of something that I own and I can guarantee it means that I have that many less variables in my potential outcome and I can make a better prediction. And I, I, there's something else I, I like about the Ross that I feel like people um, kind of probably overlook it's the fact that look if we're doing contributions or conversions we're really talking about in essence a basis amount right that Mm -hmm. we have now already paid so even if we saw a future it'd be very hard to believe that there's going to be a future where we're going to go back on the basis amount right now future growth Mm -hmm. right you could you could throw that out there but uh you know honestly i I, i'm in the same boat that it seems very minimal the other thing that i did for a little while when i would talk to clients would say you know because of the RMD rules today, right? You'd say, well, would you pay $1 for no RMDs? 
<laughs> from your IRA. You think, yeah, everybody would pay one dollar from mm-hmm. their IRA. You, you know, you say, well, would you pay a hundred dollars? Well, depending <laughs> on the size of your account, you have ten thousand dollars. Yeah, you'd probably pay a hundred dollars for no RMDs. There's some amount that you would pay, hundred percent, to get rid of RMDs, mm-hmm. right? And I think now when I look at Secure Act, would you pay something? So your kids weren't forced into a taxable event after your death with your traditional IRA. You'd pay something, yep. right? So when you get to the point of, well, if it's close, you probably would pay something. One, for the insurance amount, right, in, in the way that you phrased it. And then, two, you probably, this RMD approach, you'd probably pay something for that, too, which I think, you know, again, gets back to that point of maybe leaning towards Roth today. Now, I think we've exhausted Roth for the, the moment being, and we will move to other topics. So... What are some other strategies, accounts that you find to be good to introduce into the retirement income picture? So you, you mentioned, you know, charitable trusts or QCDs or HSAs, and how are you positioning those? Yeah, actually, I think the last one you hit on is probably the one that is, is most, uh, most interesting to me is this concept of, you know, using HSAs as long-term either retirement or tax-free buckets with the, with the idea that, you know, if I start an HSA today, I can effectively keep copies of my, you know, receipts for decades and use it to justify future tax-free distributions. It seems like a, an absolute no-brainer. So the HSA, and, and a lot of people use those HSAs as slush funds, right? Like I put the money in and then I take the money out as soon as I have a medical expense. And if you're, if you're fortunate enough to be able to pay those medical expenses with out-of-pocket money and leave your HSA alone, it's a no-brainer. People say, well, what if I need the money? What if I'm cash flow you know, poor? Well, then no problem. Take it out of the HSA. You have the, you have the receipts to back it up. Right? Show me the receipts. Well, I got the receipts. <laughs> you know, the, we, it's there, and you could take it out tax-free. And, and that's a key difference between HSAs and most other uh, types of accounts. right? Like, for instance, an IRA, if you want to use the, uh, the health expense deduction, the expense has to align in the same year as the distribution. Right? If we're looking at 529 plans and you want tax-free distributions, you've got to pay the expense in the same year you take the money out of the retirement. But with HSAs, there's that ability to effectively just hold on to those receipts, add them up, and then the amount of unreimbursed expenses you have can justify a tax-free distribution at any year, even if it's you know, 15, 20 years later. So uh, that is pretty powerful. Uh, as far as the charitable part of this goes, I think that really you know, gets down to what the client's goals are. Uh, certainly at seven and a half, if you have an IRA, I think that's the QCD is kind of like the gold standard of giving to charity. You're giving away money that will be taxable at some point definitively in the future, whether to you or your heirs. You know, sometimes people say, well, what about appreciated stock? Like, isn't, isn't that a better way? And to me, especially as you get, you know, into the you know, ages 70 and a half plus, we're not talking about people with 50 year life expectancies and seven and a half is the earliest you could use the QCD. If you're 80, again, you, you just, you don't have 25 year life expectancy. If you hold on to that appreciated stock, the tax bill goes away, but the uh, IRA is always going to be subject to income tax at some point in the future. And, and I know Jamie, you, you, you very, probably wisely moved us on from Roth IRAs because I could just stay there all day. But, you know, there are some contraindications sometimes as why you shouldn't do Roth IRAs. And, you know, the QCD would be one of those, right? Like I've, I've run into people like, hey, we're going to give to charity. Uh, how are you going to do it? Okay, we're, we're gonna pre- we have no IRA money left. Well, why not? Did you convert it? Why didn't you? Why did you leave some of it around to maybe, you know, use for charitable contributions down the road? So QCDs are awesome. I mean, look, donor advised funds for taxable accounts are um, with today's high deduction, uh, standard deduction rate. Uh, it's, it's really difficult for a lot of families to get there. And even for for advisors, you know, especially for retired clients, we're talking about retirement income. People say, well, my clients are more likely to itemize because they are um you know, they're, uh, they're in a high income. No, not, not really. Actually, if your clients are 70 and a half th- and they're high income or high net worth, they're probably less likely to itemize. Let's think about what it goes into it, right? You've got uh, state and local taxes. We'll give you the 10,000. If you're a married couple and you're, you know, seven and a half or older, you're also 65 or older, which means you get the additional standard deduction. So now we're talking like in 2022, more than 18, 28,000 rather dollars yeah. to get there. So where's the other 18,000? Is it coming from the mortgage interest to your house? No, if you're 71 and you're high income, high net worth, you're either done with your mortgage or you're on the tail end where it's almost all principal. So 
high income, medical expense deductions, you're not getting above 7.5%, you're not itemizing anymore, uh, unless you give massive amounts away to charity. And if you do, probably the first ten or $15,000 is not moving your needle at all. You're just catching up to the standard deduction. So, you know, those donor advised funds are, uh, are key. And then it's, you know, looking at the next generation. What are, what are the things that... Um, you know, when we're looking at trusts, right, what, what's our goal? Are we looking at minimizing income tax liability? Are we looking at minimizing estate tax liability? Um, but the retirement distribution uh, end of things is, is just, it's fascinating. And then how do you incorporate annuities if you if you do? You know, that's, that's such a hot button issue in our industry today where there's, you know, we, we I actually, I hate the word annuity. I, I don't know if I should say that because I can. might get... You know, we, we've, we, it's part of this, so you could go ahead and you can say, I hate annuities. No, 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 right? no, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say I hate annuities. I, I hate the word <laughs> annuity because the word annuity means a high, ridiculously expensive, low benefit variable annuity. Now, again, not all variable annuities are like that. It's from high income folks. There makes a ton of sense. Defer your, you know, get that tax deferred wrapper for sure. But some of these, let's just call them junky products, right? Let's just... You call a spade a spade. There are some really high cost, low benefit products out there. We call an annuity. Then we look at things like a fixed annuity, not a you know, uh, but purely like a CD replacement. Well, that somehow gets the same word in front of it as a fixed indexed annuity, as does a variable annuity, as does a SPIA, as does a QLAC or something like that. And these are demonstrably different products and do you know very different things and have tremendous amounts of differing academic research behind them right like there's a lot of academic research to support the use of qualified longevity annuity contracts and deferred annuities but people hear the word annuity and it's like dracula seeing the sun all of a sudden it's like you know can't can't let that happen and and so i hate the word annuity i wish we could call each of those things something a little bit different like an income annuity gets its own name now uh, a variable annuity gets its own name a fixed index cd like replacement gets its own name so we can like people know what it is and we can start to differentiate you know um there, you know, obviously, there's a you know, very famous advertising campaign. I hate annuities, and so should mm -hmm. you. Or, yeah. you know, that's um, really good <laughs> well, from the annuity industry is trying to do its best to kind of move away from the the term annuity, right, and kind of rebrand itself mm -hmm. and you know change a little as bit it of should, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> as it should. The uh, so yeah, the it, you you got a little fired up there on that one, right? So <laughs> not not passionate about it, no, it at all. It's uh so so in this series, we also have Dr. Michael Finka, who's you know between him and Blanchett lead the very small group of the QLAC, you know, lovers group. Oh, yes, and, the know. QLAC Appreciation yep. Club. Yes, yeah. yes. I uh, was uh, happy to join as a member a few years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, you know, maybe when we wrap up all these, we will, I, maybe we will just go ahead and order those T-shirts and send them to everybody because, you know, we've, we've been talking about it online for a while. That's so. true. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, I know you said to move away from the Roth. I just need to make this comment. When I wrote my book, Rewirement, um, one of the negative comments on Amazon was like, hey, the book's pretty good, but the guy like way overemphasizes Roth. And I like I wanted to put that as like a quote on the next book, right? Like <laughs> just take the negative ones where people are like, this guy keeps talking about the benefits of annuities like they suck. And I was like, that's like the quote on the next book in the front, right? <laughs> Uh, so how have you seen, since your time in here, right, um, how have you seen the retirement income conversation start to shift, right? Because it has a lot, right? And uh, you were even talking about, you know, Ross, every CPA was like, hey, don't do that. Um, annuities can play a role in tax efficiency, too, depending on whether you want to annuitize it and prorated sure. distribution. Um, but how are you seeing that conversation shift in the retirement income space? Well, I think one of the things that we look at now is um, is looking at the, the the play of income tax and estate tax, right? And, and twenty years ago, everybody was worried about the estate tax. That was the primary concern uh, of everyone. Uh, I mean, I, I shouldn't say the primary, but it was it was a big concern, right? Everybody, you weren't cool unless you had a credit shelter trust, right? Everybody had to have a credit shelter trust, and you needed it to a large degree. I mean, twenty years ago, we were looking at about a six hundred and seventy five thousand dollar. Uh, you know, state tax exemption today, we're at north of $12 million. And even if we go back down to six, 
uh, that covers almost everyone, especially with portability and kind of the built-in credit shelter trust of the tax code, if you will, in the form of portability. You know, just file the the state tax return, transfer that exemption, and there you go. There's twice the, the twice mm-hmm. the value. So, not to say that credit shelter trusts don't play a role. There's still a, a place for them for the right client. But the idea that um, we now have to worry much more about minimizing income tax, or we we get the luxury, I should say, of doing that. And I say the luxury because when we're forced to worry about the estate tax, there's a lot of things that we do that come at the expense of income tax play, right? So think just from a simple perspective, gifting away assets so that future appreciation is out of the estate. Great from an an estate tax play. I've moved all that appreciation out of the estate and that future appreciation doesn't eat into my exemption. But when I die, there's no step up in basis. Well, if I don't have to worry about the estate tax because I've got more than enough dollars in terms of uh, the money I hold today, uh, excuse me, in terms of my exemption, then I can focus purely really on the income tax play. I can figure out how to keep assets in my estate intentionally, sometimes even intentionally throwing them into multiple persons' estates to try and get multiple Mm step-ups. So I think that's been a real regime change of I don't, I don't focus nearly as much, and the average advisor doesn't, and the average client doesn't nearly as much today on estate tax planning as they do income tax planning uh, at death. And then just the, the pace at which rules are changing, I think, is, is much quicker today. That's another, um, you know, something else that I think we have to contend with. And not only the, the pace of the changes, but where we are as a country. You know, when we talk about tax policy, it's really, it's, it's almost impossible to divorce it from political discussions, right? Because tax policy is made by politicians and like it or not, there are differences between our two parties and um, doesn't mean that we have to, you know, we have to say, I like this or I don't like this. But at, at the at the highest level, we know that Republicans see tax, you know, taxes one way, Democrats largely see it another way. And we are so polarized today in Washington, we get very few bipartisan acts. And so what that results in is the second a, um, especially in the tax area, right, where we can pass reconciliation bills, where we need only a simple majority in the Senate. Right? It's different than, um, you know, gun control or, or any of these other big social issues. We can have a reconciliation bill. Well, that basically means that the second one of those laws is passed, the other party has a singular goal of undoing everything that was just in that bill, right? Like Democrats desperately want to undo most, if not all, of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Republicans have tried for years to unwind elements of, uh, you know, of the ACA, right? Like when you pass these one party bills and just where we are today as a country, we've become more polarized. It it really creates some planning challenges and, and planning implications because your 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 certainty about the future rules is is much less than it would be in a climate where you have at least some bipartisan like no one's talking about unwinding secure act 1.0 the og if you will right uh because it was a bipartisan bill everybody was on board with it or at least enough people that it's not really possible in today's climate to unwind it but boy if you get you know if if something happens this november polls change and democrats can pick up five or six seats in the house and another seat or two in the senate they will unwind the Tax Cut and Jobs Act like that. So tell me how you see advisors interfacing with, uh, you know, like CPAs, but also estate attorneys and other things like that. And also given the fact that if you ask most advisors, they don't want to position themselves as a tax advisor. In fact, many of their firms would prefer they don't you know, mention taxes at all sometimes. <laughs> Um, so, so how does this advisor who is keeping track of all of the financial uh, dealings and so forth interface with somebody like you or with an estate attorney to really get the most out of this, given some of the, the constraints that they themselves have? All right. So I'm, I'm going to break that down into to two parts. Let's talk first about this idea of like you're not allowed to give tax advice or, or, you know, or don't talk about the idea like don't talk about taxes is Maybe I'll upset somebody, but it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Everything you do, it has a tax impact. You sell a stock, it might push you a hundred dollars over a Medicare Part B premium. That's an issue. Uh, You you know you capture law, but like everything you do, you tell the client, well, did you fund your traditional IRA this year? Well, why don't you tell them? Did you fund your Roth IRA? Everything you do has a tax impact, and there's a huge difference between quote unquote tax advice, true tax advice, and tax education, tax information information, projections about what taxes will be. Um, you know, we're not all um, longevity 
specialists, right? But we will go and we'll put some information into a, a longevity calculator. We we'll say, hey, calculator says uh, it thinks you have this amount. Well, we could do the same thing with taxes. You don't have to be a tax expert to say, hey, I plug some numbers into some software for you. It looks like if you do a conversion now, we're going to add $25,000 to your income tax bill this year, uh, but you'll never pay tax again on that. That's not, ed- that's not advice. Advice is, hey, I looked into this and I know you were questioning whether you could take this conservation easement. And based on my reading of the tax code, you are more likely than not to be able like that's tax advice saying I plug some numbers into a calculator is not and there's everything we do is taxes it's uh, it, it's been harder to actually even pin down tax advice the IRS has lost a lot of those battles right mm-hmm. circular 230 has actually not been so kind to them and no, <laughs> not at all no it, it, it the idea that you can't do those things is is just I mean, if you're going to be a good advisor, you have to. But I like that idea that it's tax education, mm-hmm. it's tax information, and uh, you know that's that's critical to sure. any decision that you're making. And then you know positioning yourself that way, I think, is very powerful. And that that goes to the second part of your question, which is like, how do you interact with these other professionals? So I think there are a few things. First off, the financial advisor is in the best position to have the information to coordinate between all these specialists, right? To, they know every, or they should know everything about the client. So whether it's connecting them to the right property and casualty insurance agent, uh, putting them in touch with the right estate planning attorney, putting them in touch with the right CPA or tax professional, the, the financial advisor it needs to be making sure that these boxes are effectively checked. And a lot of times the way I think about it is a client may come in and they may have three out of like six boxes checked, right? Like, hey, I've got a great estate planning attorney. I've got a good property and casualty guy, but I don't have anybody who does taxes. And you're like, well, Betty on our team or Betty is a partner to our firm or Betty works with a lot of our clients. She's a great CPA. Let me introduce you and make sure you, you, you check that box. You just you need to be able to fill those spaces in the clients uh, and get them to the right people. I think the second part of that is making sure that you understand what's been recommended for the client because you're probably going to see the client the most often, right? I mean, a CPA once, maybe if they do tax projections twice a year, uh, attorney once, you know, a decade <laughs> for most clients. I'd like it to be more than that, but you know, like uh, I always joke around, like many of our clients come into the office with their estate plan chiseled on the stone tablets they were first created on um, because they're so old. So, uh, you know, that's important. And then um, just making sure that you know enough to say, hang on a second, I think there's some, that's the biggest thing, right? Is I- I'd love it if advisors, it could be, um, you know, super knowledgeable. Say, hey, here's what you need to do here, and I, like that would be great, right? Um, but if you can just know enough to raise a red flag and say, eh, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what it is, but there's there's something here, right? Um, uh, I'll give a good example. So uh, somebody maybe a week or so ago called me up and he remembered having heard me say something about leaving uh, charity money through a trust, an IRA, right? And didn't, didn't remember what it was, but just remembered like, I know there's something here. Um, and he was talking about this idea of a pecuniary bequest, right? A specific dollar amount left to a, a charity via a trust or a will. Didn't, didn't remember all of it, but knew enough to say, I think there's something here that doesn't smell right raised a red flag, and sure enough, there would have been a, a significant tax hit for, for this client's estate had, um, had their strategy been implemented without this advisor saying, eh, I, I, I don't know, but I just want to bring this issue forward. So I think that's where advisors can be incredibly valuable. And then the last part is just dealing with professionals in a professional way. You know, most of the time, the professionals are going to be right, and you're going to want to rely on that, you know, that information. And, and, but every once in a while, people make mistakes. We're all human. Right? I make mistakes. I'm sure, at some point you've made mistakes. You know, the the most important thing is to to go about it and do things in a professional way. Remember, we're here for the client, and if you do spot something that you're not sure about or you think is an error, call the professional without the client on the line. You know, say, "Hey, I was wondering about X," and I think adding these few words at the end of your discussion. What do you think? just totally changes the dynamic of the conversation, right? Like, hey, I saw this in your will. I thought I learned this from somewhere else, but you know, this is not my area of expertise. I was just wondering, like, what do you think? And it just 
immediately backs that person down, feels like you're not encroaching on their space, like, oh, I'm the attorney, you need to listen to me, uh, or I'm, uh, you know, sorry, Jamie, you know, just uh, from the attorney perspective. <laughs> it's like every one of these episodes, somebody wants to take a shot at the attorney, you know, it's just, it's just a financial advisor world, and CPAs think they're, you know, all much better than these attorneys, but where do you go when you need the documents? <laughs> That's true. That's fair. That's fair. We cannot draft those documents. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I love the disarming language. Um, I, I told somebody this to an advisor. Um, I was on a thing and they were saying, how do you deal with compliance out there and, and get better <laughs> outcomes? I said, don't go into compliance meetings with an adversarial tone. And so many advisors do, right? Like mm -hmm. they say, oh, you can't do this. And you immediately go in and you're going in for war. And I was like, if you go in for war, you know how they're going to treat you? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to war with them too. Mm -hmm. If you come in and do things like, well, what do you think? How did we get here? Right? Right. Different. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like what could we do to make this work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, there's a there's a guy on TikTok that always does this too, and I, I thought it was like a really cool thing. He's like, "How'd you do that?" <laughs> and people are like, "What? How'd you look that good?" And like you can just see like people like light up for like whatever he does. He does this lead into it, and I was like, "It's a really cool way to phrase things and um, just kind of bring that warmth to the table." Well, this has been really fantastic. I, um, I'm going to ask you to, even though I know you're not close to retirement, but we've been asking everybody in this series, right? What is your, you know, what does that financially free retirement look like for Jeff Levine? Boy, you're right. Um, it's, it's, it's like so far, I don't know. Like I, well, I guess I do know. Like financially free for me means um, a few things. I'm able to retire with uh, my wife in, in the lifestyle that we want, right? So that, um, you know, we don't need to live lavishly. But I also, you know, if I want to go for a nice dinner, I don't want to have to worry about going for a nice dinner. If I want to go see my grandkids someday, you know, I want to be able to pick up on a plane and, and go see my grandkids. Um, so being able to retire comfortably means being able to do that without really worrying about what the market's doing on any particular day, month, week, year, whatever. Uh, it also means that uh, my kids are well taken care of, that they've gone to school uh, or, you know, I, I, I hope, look, I hope my kids go to college, but, um, but if not, that they have gone on to, to do the best that they can in, in, and that I've given them an opportunity in life. Uh, I know it's, it's always an interesting conversation. Do you want to pay for your kid's education or do you not? And, you know, I want my kids to maybe have some skin in the game, so maybe take some loans. But if they do well, don't tell them this. <laughs> um, but I, I, I might want to take care of at least, you know, college and, and, and look, if I can, even master's for them. Uh, and then it's just the idea that um, I work because I want to and not because I have to. And that's probably going to be a long, I hope it's a really long stage of my life, right? It means I've gotten to that, you know, financial freedom, retirement, whatever you want to call it phase. Um, but I don't ever see kind of stopping. I don't know what I do with myself. Um, I enjoy what I do today. Um, one thing I think is going to continue is, is policy changes and people will need to dive in and explain what's going on. And we'll have to see where, uh, where that lands but i just i'd love the idea of just working when i want to how i want to on the projects i want to with absolutely no you know concern about how much you need to you know to make or to sock away or to save just you just know that you're good and you're doing it because it's a passion you know mm -hmm. and you know, today I'm, I'm already kind of part of the way there and that I work because it's a passion. I mean, I need to work today. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. I very much need to work, but I, I have a passion for this. I just hope that passion continues. I, I love hearing it framed that way. And, you know, I follow your blogs. I, I follow you around the speaking circuit. I'm so I sorry. Follow, I follow <laughs> your, your tweet storms when new legislation comes out. But, you know, what, what do you want to leave as a professional legacy? What, how, do you, how do you want people to remember, you know, Jeff Levine in the retirement income space? Boy, that's heavy. I mean, um, I, it'd be an honor just to leave a legacy of some sort. You know, that's, um, I, I hope I can do that. That would be amazing. I think if I could pick one thing, it would be that I was able to help more advisors to deliver better advice to their clients because they were more engaged in learning. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm super passionate about is less boring CE. I just so I always joke around that most CE is kind of like the old Ben Stein commercial, like dry eyes, try clear, eyes. and and as you know, especially from the CPA world, but even in the financial planning world, it's it's just boring. And when you're bored, you tune out. You don't 
pay attention as well. You don't learn as well. And so if I could continue uh, to, you know, my favorite all-time CE, you know, you get comments on your CE. My favorite all-time comment was half CE, half comedy special. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, if I could do something like that and, and keep advisors more engaged and attuned because they're interested in learning and they're having fun, and then we can add in all that technical stuff on top of it, and they're able to go out and impact, you know, hundreds, thousands of families, that would be a pretty cool legacy. Well, for somebody that's watched your CE and participated in your CE and interviewed you during CE projects, <laughs> I, uh, really, like you, you do have a way of uh, bringing sometimes a dry topic. Um, you know, something taxes like a, dry. No, something no. entertainment, but more <laughs> you know, entertainment, but more useful and more actionable. And uh, I've always admired that about you. Thank yeah. you. Matt. That means a lot. Thank you. It, it, uh, so you're you're trying to create the the mask version of the CE because. Stein is in the mask, and Jim Carrey is the Canadian, <laughs> right? So yeah. that is that. That is the combination of the two. That's it. You, you, <laughs> you, you sunk my battleship, Jamie. <laughs> uh, you know, we're getting really deep with the uh, like 1994 references here. It's really <laughs> solid. I love it. <laughs> Well, Jeff and Devin, this has been amazing. Thank you for, you know, both of you for everything that you do. And Jeff, continue to impact the industry and bring uh, that half comedy and half CE special to everybody out there, including more, you know, GIF uh, little, you know, fun parades out there from time to time. Give me more legislation and we'll do it. <laughs> and thank you, everyone else, for listening to this episode of the Framework Podcast. Podcast.